Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast. This is Tough Girl Extra, which is when we go back and speak with previous guests we've spoken to before. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode. The Tough Girl Podcast Extra and the Tough Girl Podcast is sponsorship and ad-free, and that's thanks to the monthly financial support of patrons. To find out more about supporting the podcast and the work that I do to increase the amount of female role models in the media, please do go and check out Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, forward slash tough girl podcast there's currently over 220 patrons who are supporting the mission to help me increase the amount of female role models take action now and become one of them the goal is to reach 250 patrons all patrons will get their name on a dedicated patrons page on the tough girl website toughgirlchallenges.com so please do go and check it out please do support the work i'm doing to increase the amount of female role models it makes such a massive difference having a regular income coming in but without further ado i'm delighted that we're going to be catching up with the awesome and inspiring Alex Mason. Tribe, I am absolutely delighted that we are catching up with previous guest, Alex Mason, or Puff Puff, as she's known by her trail name. Alex's mission is to live a life that she loves, to impact minimally on the environment, to inspire others through her stories, to give back, and to help to provide the world with safe water. Alex, how are you? How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you, Sarah. It's been a while since I spoke to you, but lots of cool stuff has been happening. You, I was just looking, because we're, we're recording this on Skype, and I think it was about a year ago that we that we last spoke, and obviously the first time we caught up, we found out more about your life, like growing up, spending time in Africa, why you decided to hike the Pacific Crest Trail twice, what, uh, yeah. you know, climbing Mira Peak in the Himalayas, and the Tioroa Trail. Um, there was so much stuff that we covered. So if you haven't um, listened to that episode, then please do go back and listen to it. Um, but yeah, it's been a year since we last spoke, and I think we did speak you were in Indonesia at that point is was that right yeah I was in Indonesia cycling around um having a lovely time but um I had been on the road uh traveling for a good 18 months um when I spoke to you and I was just about to come home uh because I was pretty tired at that point and uh, I think I just needed a, a little break a little rest a little reconnect with family and friends and and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I made my way home. um, And it was so nice to just come back to a little bit of normality, catch up with everyone, um, see my friends, see friends that had babies and all that kind of thing. I feel like you miss out a lot sometimes on kind of just normal life when you're away having this amazing time. Everyone just carries on living their normal lives. and, And it's nice to come back and just be involved in that sometimes. It's always nice to to come back to a bit of normality, your own bed, and you know have a bit of a routine, and and to not it can be I I do understand what you're saying it can be really draining when you're when you're on the road when you're constantly traveling when you're constantly moving about. I mean, obviously there's a lot of pro, pros to it all, but there's a lot of cons. So Definitely. How did you adjust back to normal life? Were you having to? Did you go back in, to go back to work? What, what, I mean, how was your body? You know, what was happening when you did get back? Did you move back in with your parents, or where, what did you come home to? um so I came home and didn't tell my parents I was coming home (laughs) so I surprised them um and I mean it all went I was going to do a bit of a bigger surprise surprise my mum and dad but uh, because they live abroad and my mum decided to come back to England so she kind of put a bit of a spanner in the works but I still managed to surprise her and went to the airport to meet I was I had to pretend I was in Singapore for like a week and when I wasn't I was in England it was very very stressful it was more stressful than traveling uh for 18 months around foreign countries it was this just organizing the surprise was horrible and um my whole body was like my legs were shaking I was, the adrenaline was like rushing through me when she came through to the airport um, but it was so worth it because it was so nice to like see how surprised she was and see how happy she was to see me. Um, so, yeah, as I said, my parents live abroad. So I'm kind of lucky that I get to live in their house in England, uh, but they're not actually there. So I, I kind of moved back in with my parents, but not really, because um, I have a house uh, in Hampton that I rent out. So I want to keep that rented because I know that I'm not going to be back uh, for long periods of time so uh, so yeah I'm kind of down in Salisbury um, and I'm doing a little bit of work here and there I'm doing a bit of freelance graphics 
Um, and that's what I did when I came back because I did a bit of freelance graphics. And then I also got a bit of a part-time job in Cotswold Outdoor just because uh, it's nice to have that social interaction with people. And sometimes when you work for yourself, as you probably know, and like when you're at home and just like tapping away on your laptop, you kind of miss that social interaction. So uh, it's been really great actually to have that and get me out of bed in the mornings and do a, like a little bit of a routine again, which has been nice. I mean, how long did it take before before you started getting itchy feet again or before you started to think, you know what, I want to get back out traveling. I want to go on another adventure. It did not take long. <laughs> um, I kind of already knew uh, when I came home that it wouldn't be long until I went off and did something again. But um, I wasn't really sure what it was going to be. Uh, having, you know, done a lot of hiking and then uh, tried the cycling, which I didn't know if I was going to enjoy, but I ended up really enjoying. There were lots of different things I could have done. My, I cycled around Australia with two German friends that I met while I was there and they invited me to come back and cycle with them in Mongolia. And I was like, I'm so tempted to do that. Then they invited me to come and cycle in like Central Asia. And I thought, like, I really want to do that too. Um, but ultimately what won was my, my desire to do the Appalachian Trail. And it was all kind of a bit last minute. Um, the decision making was kind of last minute. So um, I didn't really have much time to prepare anything. Um, and I probably started a little bit later than I wanted to. But it all worked out to the best in the end. <laughs> so what I'm really interested in is sometimes when you have lots of different options, you know, cycling in Mongolia, I mean, sounds incredible, or going back to hiking. You know, how do you decide? Like, how do you, yeah, how do you decide? What's your method? Oh, it's really difficult because I want to do everything. <laughs> I hear you this is why I'm asking this question <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's not really a lot that I don't want to do um but I kind of I think you just have to go with your gut instinct most of the time um the Appalachian Trail you know, having hiked the PCT already and you know there's the thing you know the Triple Crown all that kind of stuff like that was quite high on my list anyway um and I think you just have to think what's going to fit in with your lifestyle at the moment what's what you've got coming up I had a wedding in September that I really wanted to be back for it was a family wedding and I've missed out on so many family things from being away so much this is something that I really wanted to be back for so I knew I had to be back then I kind of looked at the time scale of things looked at my finances looked at you know what needed planning you know uh, having a bike and stuff is financially more than it is hiking because you've got a bike to worry about shipping that all the costs that come with like maintaining it and stuff so it was just a mixture of all of those things that made me think that hiking um was the best thing for me last year with with the Appalachian Trail I mean I think this is the interesting thing because you know you have hiked the PCT northbound and southbound you've done the Tour Rare Trail you are such an experienced hiker and I believe it says on your website as well that you've, you've hiked over like 7,000 miles or kilometers um, yeah psychologically or mentally are you sort of, is it, is it in your, I mean, do you get nervous before like a big hike or do you feel it's very much sort of in your comfort zone and that it's not going to be like an issue? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't really get nervous about hiking anymore because I know I'm capable of doing it. I know that there'll be tough days. I know that um, it will hurt some days. I know that some days I'll be miserable and some days I'll cry. Um, but I, I like, I know all that's coming up, but ultimately I, I know that, you know, mentally I can deal with it and physically I can deal with it as well. And unless something drastic happened, like, you know, fell over and broke my leg or something, then I, I will keep going, especially if it's, somewhere like in America where you can't just pop home fairly easily you have to you know that's quite a logistical thing um so I don't know I, I don't really get that I don't feel nervous I feel like that it, nervous excitement um but in terms of like being out of your comfort zone or anything I just I don't really feel that anymore what what were your expectations for the Appalachian Trail? I mean, did you did you have any? Were you was there anything that the yeah? What were the expectations? I'm trying not to put words in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, when you do long distance hikes, as you probably know, you spend quite a lot of time talking about other long distance hikes that are around. 
Um, when I did the PCT, uh, lots of people who were on the PCT had already done the Appalachian Trail because that's um, the more natural progression is to start with the AT and then move through to the PCT and then the CDT. Um, so I already had some kind of ideas from other people about what I was going to expect from the trail. And I knew that it wasn't going to be like the PCT and it wasn't going to be the same experience and I knew the nickname was the green tunnel and I knew I was going to spend a lot of time in the trees um didn't really realize how humid it was going to be because it was humid oh my god I was just suffering some days and that really drains your energy um but I I kind of knew it was going to be you know, mentally a similar experience to the PCT so I was kind of prepared for that what was it like starting out on the trail? I was going to say, like, t- yeah, t- um, take take us back to. I believe you started at Amacola. Amacola. Am- I can't even say it. Amacola Falls. <laughs> Amacolola. That's yeah. the one. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. So I got super lucky, and um, a very kind lady called Aileen contacted me on my Instagram and offered me a place to stay in Atlanta beforehand because I think actually that was the thing I was most worried about is like how do I get to the start um but these things have a way of working themselves out and I got to stay in the most incredible house with a beautiful pool and like a wine cellar in the bottom and I thought like do I want to leave this place? <laughs> Can I just stay here for a few months? That would be great. Um, but she drove me up to the start and came and hiked um, up the set of stairs. I can't remember how many stairs there are now, but there are a lot. And it's quite a shock to the system um, having to set off and hike up about a thousand stairs uh, when you haven't really done any training, you haven't really done any planning. Um, so it's it's quite a brutal start, and I was and my bag was too heavy, and it was silly really because I've done enough to know what I need to carry and what I don't need to carry. But I was carrying too much stuff with me, and uh, yeah, it was quite a brutal start. And I thought, oh goodness, am I gonna? What am I doing? Why am I doing this again? Like, why why am I putting my body through this again? But no, I'm glad I did. It was just um, it was yeah, it was quite a brutal start, but it was. You know, not everybody does start at Amicalola. There's obviously other ways to start. You can go and um, kind of start the other side of Springer Mountain and hike up and back. Um, but, you know, the stairs were a challenge and I thought, yep, yeah, I'll take that on as well. <laughs> Love it. I didn't do the stairs. I started at Springer Mountain. <laughs> I don't blame you. I don't blame you. The stairs were not that fun, but, you know yeah I did it anyway (laughs) did you fall in with a trail family or you know was it yeah was it would would you say it's as as sociable as the PCT was like how do the people differ um it's super sociable uh it is probably there's it's hard to kind of gauge completely but I would say there there are more people on the AT than there are on the PCT um and because of all the huts and things like that you you see more people congregated so on the PCT when you start in the desert the biggest congregations of people happen around water sources because they are few and far between um obviously on the AT there's a lot more water um so they're both incredibly sociable trails but I found on the start of the AT I was going a lot further in distance than most people were when they started out so people were starting doing five or ten between five and ten miles I guess but I was doing kind of 15 20 so I was never around the same people for very long I would camp uh with a with a group of people and have a chat with them and get to know them and it'd be great but then I'd move on and I probably wouldn't see them again um so that was quite difficult and that kind of carried on uh, mostly up until about the halfway point there were a few points where I made um, uh, some little groups and uh, but you meet people that are maybe only doing a section hike or um, are getting off trail at some point and then back on so you don't form those lasting kind of trail families and then when I got to halfway, I stayed at a hostel and I just made a decision to take a day off. I think 
can't quite remember. I think I did that. And then um, I ended up uh, hiking with these uh, two people, Bryce and Peaches. And we kind of were making plans like you do to kind of get to the same place at the end of the day. And then we'd camp at the same place and kind of a week went by and we realized that we're kind of hiking together now. And then we picked up a few more people. People kind of came in and out of the group. Um, but we had a, a strong group of about six, six of us. And we ended up hiking basically from the halfway point all the way to the end, all the way, all the way to the end. Uh, so Peaches and I did the halfway to the end and then different people came in and out of our group which was it was really lovely to get that trail family because I was that was something I really enjoyed about the PCT is the social and human aspect of it and the views and stuff were incredible and the experience is incredible but you can't really beat the you know meeting people from all walks of life and making new friends and stuff like that so I was really happy when I was able to kind of find that little trail family because it did um, make make my experience what it was, I guess. And I was starting to get a bit a bit lonely, <laughs> I guess, from from the start to halfway. And even though you would meet people, it was like it wouldn't be a lasting relationship. So you'd put all all that effort into getting to know people and making friends, and, and then you'd have to do it all over again, which can, I mean, it sounds silly, but it can be really draining just, you know, doing that same thing, telling your story over and over again. Uh, it's nice to just have people around you that you don't have to explain yourself to. You don't have to constantly tell them where you're from and, you know, what you've done. And they just, they just know you and that you can just be with them. You don't have to, you know, be on your, on your, like, best form you can just <laughs> if you're having a grumpy day then they understand so yeah it was it was nice to get that little trail family going yeah. what was your biggest challenge on the Appalachian Trail um I guess my biggest challenge was I gave myself a time pressure um so I know you did it in 100 days which was very impressive having done it that's like you know beast mode um but I so I did it in 115, which is still on like the faster end of uh, an average hike, I'd guess. Uh, most people take about, well, it's about 130, 40, up to 100, kind of 60 days to do do the Appalachian Trail. Um, so in my mind, I started out thinking I would just get as far as I could get in the time I had. Because like I said, I wanted to get back to this wedding and I already had my flight booked. So I had a time pressure. And then, you know, you get halfway and you think, well, I'm, I'm on target to do this. Um, and then but it's always in the back of your mind. I feel like when you you have a time pressure, it's always there niggling away. And if you do have a day where you might not do as many miles, you feel like guilty and you start thinking, oh, God, you know, I might not make it. And it's all self-imposed pressures. And people would come up to me and say, oh, you know, you might, you've might not got a lot of time, you might not make it. And I would say, oh, you know, I'm just going to see how far I get. You know, it doesn't matter. But in the back of my mind, it's like, it does matter. I want to get to the end. I don't want to not finish it. But I would be very much, like, quite blasé about it to people. But, yeah, in... I knew that I, I wanted to get to the end. So, I, I think yeah. it is interesting when you do have these, like, self-imposed, time pressures because I when you're talking about like the guilt and that fear of failure like oh I, I remember it so acutely I mean I was actually never on target <laughs> until, <laughs> until you know even like two days before it was still like god I'm like 70 miles out um oh, god. mentally how did you find it yeah I don't know how you did that last two days and that, that was, they're brutal those last two days. <laughs> oh, they're really <laughs> hardcore <laughs> um mentally I mean you just have to accept what is going to be will be because you can I was going to say like there's nothing you can do about it I mean you can you can put like extra effort in and all that kind of stuff but if it's a detriment to you can't your enjoyment of the experience I'm not sure if it's like worth it. And I always tell people who ask for advice on long distance hiking and I'm like, just don't worry about time. Don't put any pressure on yourself. You know, if you have to skip a bit, you have to skip a bit. 
And in reality, I'm here being all hypocritical, being like, <laughs> I'm putting all the pressure on myself. <laughs> I'm worrying about time. I'm worrying about all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I very rarely listen to my own advice, um, which yeah, which I should. But, um, yeah, mentally, it can be tough. But the rewards, I think, at the end are are worth it definitely and what about a favorite memory or a moment I know that's so difficult because there's obviously going to be so many of them but now you've had maybe you know a bit more time to reflect back what are the moments that that you still think about now that still pop up in inside your head it's I you must know this it's so hard to pick a moment or a memory from such an intense and long experience um but I, there, there are a few moments that I, I look back on and I'll never forget and they always make me laugh and most of them are to do with the people I was hiking with and our experiences and I just tell one story about um, the lake moose which uh, we we all really wanted to see a moose we'd seen a few bears and I've never seen a moose in like real life before and um, I didn't even know they had them on the trail yeah they're on did you see one did no you see one? I didn't know I didn't, um, literally didn't know that they was that part of the world yeah there are a bunch of moose especially like north towards like New Hampshire Maine kind of area they're not down in the south they're just up in the north and um so I would we were like trying to be really stealthy and uh walk through the forest convinced we would see a moose but we didn't see one and we were told, we kept being told that if you um, are near a lake, you're more likely to see a moose because they hang out near the lake. Um, and we thought, OK, so one night, um, I think we were, we could have been in the 100 mile wilderness or maybe just before, um, we camped near a lake. And so we were like, this is it. This is the night we're going to see a moose. So we kind of hung out a bit. There were no moose around. There was no animal activity at all. So we all went uh, to sleep in our tents. There were, there were four of us. And um, in about 2 a.m., I heard this splashing and it sounded exactly like somebody walking up and down a lake or like walking up and down in water. And uh, my friend jukebox she like was like puff puff are you awake I was like yeah she was like, do you think that's a moose like, definitely it's definitely a moose and then peaches woke up and she was like I'm gonna go and look and I thought the worst thing we could do right now is get up and go and see because moose are really like dangerous they can charge at you and they like will stomp on you they're probably more dangerous than like a bear uh, because they can be really aggressive, especially if they've got young. And uh, I thought the worst thing we could do is get up and go and see what this is. But not wanting to miss out on seeing the moose, I got up and went with them. And we put our head red lights on our head torches and we crept as quietly as we could down to the lake, which is like just through these little bushes. And the sound was just the gentle lapping of the waves on the shore. <laughs> it was not anything walking up and down, but the comedy of it, like us at 2 a.m. with our head torches on, creeping down to the lake because we thought there was a moose in the lake, was just it would just stand out in my mind for a lot, for like forever. Um, because getting up in the morning is so hard, right? You're just like, you're tired, you're, I don't want to get out of my sleeping bag, you're all warm. Two o'clock in the morning when there's a moose, leap out your sleeping bag, <laughs> get down to the lake. So, yeah, there are just like silly moments like that where it just makes it all all worthwhile, really. All the all the hard times. But, yeah, I, I did see a moose, but not in the lake. Um, so it's pretty scary as well. My heart was absolutely hammering because it was enormous. Oh, my goodness. The did, moose are huge. You saw the moose on the trail? Yeah. Yeah. What, that's awesome. But did you yeah, get a photo? Got, did you get on camera? No, nah, well, I got, I did, but the footage is pretty bad because it was, it wasn't like bang on the trail. It was a little bit off in some bush, like in some trees. Um, and it had a baby with it. Oh. And I, and because Peaches saw it first and she was like, look through the trees. And I looked in the baby and I was like, it's massive, it's massive. And she was like, no, you're looking at the baby. Look over there. And I was like, oh, oh my God. God. And it was terrifying. And we got out there. Well, we kind of stood for a while and had observed it. But as soon as it moved, we were out of there like a shot. Because, yeah, they're pretty scary when they've got, when they've got babies. 
the absolute yeah. sen- sensible decision. Yeah. <laughs> so what was life like after the Appalachian Trail? Was like post-adventure blues, injuries? Did you have to go back to work? How was the, your food? How was, I, I know, I'm, the reason I'm saying weight is because I lost so much weight on the Appalachian Trail. I was just wondering if that was the same thing for you. So yeah, just what was life like for you after, you, you know, you did complete the trail in your deadline. You got back for your wedding, which is awesome. So you're back in the UK. I think it was like late September. Was that right? Yeah, so I finished the trail on the 31st of August and then uh, spent a week in Boston, which was lovely. Um, And then came back to England, all the focus was on getting ready for the wedding. I was all nice, super skinny, you know, lost loads of weight, like you said. Um, Always do on those long distance trails because I tend to like lose my appetite and all I really survive on is Twix bars and crisps. So um, I burn that off pretty quickly and then end up losing loads of weight. So the focus was on going and getting a nice outfit and looking great and um and then I had real problems um uploading videos and blogs and stuff when I was on the trail because the wi-fi is extraordinarily rubbish on that side of the states um so in the end I just I stopped kind of uploading it because it was too stressful um to try and find the time and try and find decent signal to to do it so I got home and I was left with loads of blogs and loads of videos to upload so I kind of threw myself into doing that um went to work for a while just because I you know the the cure for the post-adventure blues is to throw yourself into a new project um or like just throw yourself into doing something and keep yourself busy that's what I always find um but I mean it worked up until a point but then there is like burnout and you get it catches up with you it always catches up with you in the end um and I I was kind of injured when I came back so my knee I was in a lot of pain with my left knee um if I sat down for any like even five minutes when I would get up again it would be really painful and it would take ages to kind of loosen up and get going and Towards the end of the trail, I tripped on a twig and it got caught up in my feet and my trekking pole, my body went forwards and my trekking pole, my arm went backwards and I kind of pulled my arm out of this place, my shoulder. And I had loads of problems like with, so it was my right shoulder and had loads of problems with the left side of my neck. It was always, almost a bit like whiplashy kind of feeling. Um, so I had my neck was really painful my arm was really painful my knee was really painful and I was super tired like more tired than I think I've ever been and just exhausted and I'd go to work and I'd come back and I'd go to sleep for a couple of hours and then I'd get up and eat something and I'd still have a good 10 hours sleep and then get up and repeat that kind of day and it got to the point where I was just I was I'm kind of a bit worried I was like am I deficient in something is there because it was a good kind of three months down the line when I just started thinking I'm still so tired this doesn't feel right um but I think it was just pure exhaustion and I think the Appalachian Trail combined with all the stuff I've been doing previously I think I was just absolutely exhausted and everything had caught up with me and I just really needed that time to just do nothing and let my body and mind kind of really rest um so that's what I've been doing a lot of resting and recovering and trying to get my body sorted out and trying to stretch and trying to you know eat healthily and all that kind of stuff and naturally you come home and you you're super skinny and you think oh I'll just eat that and eat that and eat that and then you end up getting fat again <laughs> so I'm like oh no so yeah back at the gym and all that kind of stuff but it, it took me a long time to recover from the AT I think just I was just totally drained when I got back um and I know I remember you saying you were as well and I don't know if that's just an AT thing or it was just a accumulation like I said of just being away and doing so much all the time but um I think the rest really helped my injuries that I picked up so my knees feeling loads better my shoulder still kind of feels like it's got a twinge but you know, I, I couldn't lift my arm like kind of higher than my shoulder level. So now from from that to now where I've basically got full range of movement again, it's much, much better. So um, but you just never know what's going to happen on the trail. Like, you know, tripping on a twig. <laughs> it's like 
Like, oh, God, you know, it could have been a lot worse. My friend got kicked by a pony and dislocated his shoulder. So that was that was bad. That didn't happen to me. But, um, yeah, you just you just never know what it's going to throw at you. Um, one one wrong move and, you know, you could be seriously damaged. But um, I was kind of lucky in a way that I just got a couple of strains. And I've been pretty lucky throughout all my trips where I've not really had too much of an injury. Um, but, yeah, recovery is, is super important. And then. You know, I think throwing myself into doing all that stuff and um, not really taking a break kind of took its toll. So I, in February, I went over to Lanzarote where my parents live and just had a proper rest, proper relax, led by the pool for a couple of weeks, was mostly horizontal for the whole time. Um, Led on the beach, went in the sea, just had just a real kind of switch off, which I think I really, really needed. Um, Because at one point I thought, you know, I'm just going to keep on traveling forever and it's going to be fine. It's going to be great. But actually, you just you need a break every now and then. You really do need a break. 100%. How are you feeling now? Like, are you feeling like as you're <laughs> literally there's so many times when you were speaking, I wanted to say, oh, me too. It's like, oh, it's, <laughs> it's my left knee as well, which is still like causing me issues. And also like recovery. It's just and I'm it's just so boring like I because I, I know I'm at the gym and I'm working through like this this personal training program and, and it's fantastic and it's awesome but it's all like the really boring exercises like it's the little movements just trying to get the muscles firing and everything and, I, and it's all the stuff I need to be doing it's the foam rolling every day it's the massaging my feet um, but actually I just want to lift heavy weights and it's like oh I can't do that until I you know really focus on the recovery so it is a bit it's frustrating, so I hear that. But, you know, are you feeling in a great place or a better place now? Are you feeling pretty much recovered, ready for another challenge? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I feel so much better than I did. And I, when I, you know, the first few weeks when I came home, I felt absolutely broken. I thought, what have I done to my body? You know, it's never going to be like it was before. I've just ruined it. Um, and... Uh, even kind of three months down the line it's frustrating because you're not seeing any improvement and you don't think it's even though it has if you look back you think yeah it has improved but at the time you're just stuck in that feeling of like oh god I'm just I feel like I'm never going to get better it's just going to be like this forever now um but now we're kind of like eight months down the line I feel so much better I'm nowhere near as tired I'm like living like a normal person now with like eight hours sleep rather than about 12 um so that's great um I sought some like advice on my injuries and like you I've been working on like the small things like firing your glutes and all that kind of stuff because oftentimes when you've got an injury with your knee it's not just because of your knee it's all associated with lots of other things as well and you know when your glute med doesn't fire properly your knee twists inwards and all that kind of stuff so um it's just working on strengthening and um proper posture and all that that kind of stuff so and I totally hear what you're saying about it being frustrating and because you you don't necessarily feel like you're making a lot of progress but but you you know it's for the greater good I guess at the end of the day that you're doing it it's patience it's patience it's always it's always like hiking again it's like you know you're having an end goal you just got to keep putting in the work every single day and yeah you will get there so I'm just I am excited to hear because I know you you must have a challenge brewing because I can't imagine (laughs) you not um so what have you got planned what have you what have you been thinking about is it going to be another hike is it going to be a bike ride is it going to be a completely different challenge what where are you going to be going next well where do I begin (laughs) (laughs) when I was on the Appalachian Trail I was very much thinking about the Continental Divide Trail so that's like the natural progression done the PCT done the AT Triple Crown Continental Divide Trail great lots of my friends from PCT 2015 they're on it this year and I'm exceptionally jealous because I keep seeing their updates and being like oh god I really want to be there um but uh in 2018 uh and 2017-18 I was a reserve for an ocean rowing crew and uh they while I was on the Appalachian Trail obviously they didn't need me to be to go and so I did the Appalachian Trail and then they went and crossed the Indian Ocean and um kept up to date with their progress kept in touch with all this kind of stuff and when I got back from the Appalachian Trail I met up with the crew and uh, one of them is putting 
well, has put together a crew to go across the Atlantic. And that's what I'm going to be doing. So I put my CDT plans on hold. Uh, I will do it one day. Fingers crossed. I put it out there now. Definitely going to do it one day. Um, but the plan is January 2020, which is scarily close. Uh, we will be crossing as a four-man team across the Atlantic. It's not part of Talisker. Um, but it's kind of the same same time as the Talisker. It's an independent challenge. Uh, we'll be taking across a crew member that has young onset Parkinson's disease, and we'll be conducting a research project with Oxford Brookes University, uh, which is carrying on the research that they um, and the results they got from the Indian Ocean crew, because that's what they did on the Indian Ocean. They took a uh, a man called Robin across the ocean uh, with young onset Parkinson's disease, and um, they are, I'm going to sound really stupid now because I don't fully understand it because it's very technical, but there is a uh, study going on that looks at the mitochondria in the cells and the way that people with Parkinson's process uh, glucose especially differently than people without Parkinson's. Um, and there is some uh, research being done into the fact that the uh, cause of Parkinson's may begin in the mitochondria of the cell, which is pretty huge because if you find the cause, then it's uh, easier in a way to then try and find a cure if you know what causes it. So yeah, it's quite quite a big thing, quite exciting, great to be involved in a project like that. Um, but not only that, uh, We'll be doing the Atlantic in January and then in April, May, <laughs> we will be crossing the Indian Ocean as well. So we're aiming for two oceans in one year, which is pretty epic. Um, and it's taking me way out of my comfort zone. I have never really done a lot on the water. The water's kind of scary to me. Um, but like we were saying right at the start, where the hiking and stuff, it doesn't give me that kind of nervous, that kind of, you know, I'm worried about what I'm doing feeling. Whereas this certainly does that. I'm thinking, oh, my God, what am I doing? Am I going to be able to do it? All those same feelings that you got when you first did it along this trail. I'm getting again with the ocean thing. So it's all that nervous energy, nervous excitement is like bubbling up. And sometimes I stop and think what on earth am I doing <laughs> do I want to do this and then other times I think this is great I can't wait you know so there's all that all all the emotions are happening right now <laughs> but you know what's amazing is I can hear the excitement in your voice <laughs> and like I can hear like the that the adrenaline almost like as in you know rowing two oceans I mean the Atlantic and the Indian is going to be phenomenal phenomenal uh, yeah so a couple of questions are you are you the only female with three guys well um for the atlantic we have three confirmed crew so that's me and two guys we've got billy taylor and scott butler uh and then we have two candidates both have young onset parkinson's one's a guy one's a girl so it could be a fully mixed crews, two guys, two girls, or it could be just little old me trying to keep the boys under control. Um, and then on the Indian Ocean, it will be a fully mixed crew. There'll be two guys, two girls. Cool. Um, so, yeah, we're just kind of working through that at the moment and seeing, you know, the best, who's the best candidate to take really in terms of research in terms of capability and all that kind of stuff so it's a big old process like the the rowing part is going to be the easy part like we get on the boat and we row and I, I use that kind of loosely as the easy part but actually getting to the start of a challenge like this is incredibly challenging in itself and having to raise all the money having to go and get sponsors having to sort out everything that goes with it the boat the food the just just everything is why I'm not doing the CDT this year because I need this whole year to basically get 
to the start of this challenge and it's it's a big undertaking and that's the bit I'm not really enjoying that much it's really stressful it's all about money money stresses me out don't like it um but I know that it's just gonna make it all worth it in the end hopefully fingers crossed <laughs> I mean just talking about money you know to row in, in the Talisker whiskey challenge it's you know it's approximately like a hundred grand per boat but you're doing it independently of that challenge so and yeah. rowing two oceans so I'm thinking like another hundred thousand i'm just throwing money around here how is sponsorship go is it is it through fundraising or are you going to be putting your hand in your pocket to to pay or is it just through sponsorship and fundraising so um yeah the talisco race is is pretty expensive because you have to pay for um you know the organization of the race as well so doing independently it's actually going to be a bit less so we're looking at around 85 grand for the both both rows um wow we are, yeah for, sorry for both know. oceans wow yeah for both oceans so the biggest cost well the boat the boat we have it was 30 grand so that's like a huge outlay um but it's also an asset as well so um we will have that and then the biggest one of the biggest expenses will come from shipping the boat because we'll ship the boat straight from antigua to australia um, so that's a huge expense, but and also of that eighty-five grand, it's not all financial, um, you know, cold hard cash that we need. A lot of that will come from uh, product sponsor. So, for example, if we have um, a satellite communication on board, um, it, the total cost of our um, comms and all that kind of stuff is probably going to be about around eighteen grand for both rows because we'd like to live stream we would like to chat to schools on the way so especially on the indian ocean we want to get um get schools involved and we can live stream to them there's a great platform called learn live which schools can sign up to for free and they can chat back to us they can type us messages and then we we can speak to them like live which is pretty cool um but it's something like that the total cost of it for us is going to be about 18 grand but if we get a product sponsor on board like intellion or someone like that then that covers that cost so it's not necessarily all cold hard cash we need um so yeah about 85 grand we're hoping to get it all through sponsor uh sponsorship we've got our first sponsor uh confirmed in the last couple of days so i guess i can say because uh home bargains have sponsored us 15 grand so we are on our way um which means we've got the boat we can take the boat and get some modifications we need to make to it um so yeah i mean it's always nice to get your first bit of money in it makes it feel like the project's going somewhere um and it gives kind of hope <laughs> for more money coming in so it's just a case of getting our sponsorship pack out to all the contacts we have loads of different companies and we're hoping that um no one is going to have to necessarily put their own own money in because being an ad adventurer or they, you don't really have a lot of money generally um so we're all in that kind of same environment um scott who's coming across the atlantic is uh about to run with a wheelbarrow across europe and he's doing i think Sorry if I get this wrong, Scott, but I think it's 38 marathons over 38 days with a wheelbarrow. Um, so we're all of that kind of genre of people where, you know, we've chosen this lifestyle over making lots of money. So we don't we don't necessarily have a lot to give. So we're hoping, yeah, that we can raise pretty much all of it from from sponsors. I have to say this is that's the, the major reason that I mean, I would love to row an ocean. But I have to say the thought of having to raise like 85,000, 70,000 pounds, 100,000, like I can feel, I feel stressed even just thinking about that sort of money. It's like, yeah, um, I feel stressed. I feel yeah. stressed too. <laughs> it's really stressful. It's really stressful. Well, good luck with it all. And it's amazing to get home and bargain on. That's absolutely fantastic. 15K banked, boom, 70K yep. to go. Um, yeah keep on keep on trucking <laughs> get after it I'm Absolutely. sure I'm sure you'll do it but start date January 2020 yeah so we provisionally penciled in January the 4th 2020 we are normally a Atlantic crossing will start in the Canary Islands and they'll start from La Gomera uh, but we are starting from Lanzarote just because my parents live there and it'll be like a nice thing to do um so we're adding an extra kind of 200 miles onto our crossing but 
hey, what's an extra 200 miles? Um, and then we'll go across to Antigua. And then the boat will ship, be shipped from Antigua to Perth, probably. Uh, and then we will uh, head up, we'll kind of come home for a couple of months. And then we'll head off to, over to Australia. We will head up to Geraldton, Fremantle kind of area. And then we will cross um, the Indian Ocean. But we are aiming to be the first people to cross continent to continent. So, or like mainland to mainland. So most people, when they cross the Indian Ocean, will go from Australia and they'll stop at Mauritius or the Seychelles. Um, but we are aiming to go further than that and head over to mainland Africa. Our desired destination will be Durban um, but we are also looking at Mombasa as a, as a backup really depending on weather you know current winds where we are pirates uh, so um, yeah so we're aiming to get a world record which is pretty cool um, it's never been something that's kind of on been on my radar I've never been really that interested in world records of being the first or being the fastest or the highest or longest you know all that kind of stuff um, but when you're presented with an opportunity to get one, you kind of think, oh, actually, that's quite cool. Um, so, yeah, I'm really looking forward. But that will be like the kind of cherry on the cake, really. It's not the main reason that I'm, I'm wanting to do it, but it will be a nice little addition to the adventure. Absolutely. Well, best of luck with it. And I'm so excited to, you know, to follow along with, with your journey, which will be amazing. And I'm going to get you to share all your websites and how we can follow along in a little bit. Because yeah. what I want to do now is I want to do some quick fire questions. Oh, OK. So my questions are going to be quick fire, but it doesn't mean your answers necessarily have to be, <laughs> have to be quick fire. Okay. OK. What book are you currently reading at the moment? Oh, God. So May, I've set myself these little mini goals. And one of my goals in May, because 2018 was shocking. I didn't think I read a, I read a single book. Um, uh, so May, I've set myself a goal to actually read a book. And I've gone really highbrow. I've gone for Martina Cole, and it's called Betrayal. So uh, we'll see how that goes. Love it. Amazing. <laughs> um, Favourite music or album? What song is, you know, in, inspiring you at the moment? Oh, um, yeah, actually, I've just restarted my Apple Music membership and I've been listening to a lot more music recently. I My favourite band of the moment is Nathaniel Rateliff and the Night Sweats. Go check them out. They're really good. They're a little bit country, American, kind of, you know, lots of kind of jangly instruments. They're great. I love them. So, yeah, they, they keep me going at the moment. Love it. Um, favourite movie? Oh, wow. That's a difficult one. I haven't seen any movies for so long. Uh, but my go-to movie, and you will you may remember this about this because of my bike ride across Australia. Where oh, I, I know what you're my, going to answer. Yeah, Priscilla. I named my bike Priscilla. So <laughs> my favourite movie of all time. And it does, you know, when you're happy, you can watch it. When you're sad, you can watch it. And it's just like whatever time, whatever you feel like. Priscilla Queen of the Desert is, you know, it's the best movie ever made. <laughs> I love it. What is your favourite tr- food for t- for the trail and favourite food in normal life? Whoa, oh, God. Trail, me and trail food don't get on at all. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> I get sick, like I'm a real faddy person anyway in kind of real life and in trail life. Um, I, if I find something I like to eat, I will eat it pretty much every day for a good couple of weeks until I think, you know what, I'm sick of that now. Um, so if someone would say, do you want to go out for a meal? I would say, yeah, let's go get Thai because I love Thai food. Delicious. It's really fresh, really kind of light, 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 a lot lighter than like Chinese, for example. Um, so I really do love Thai food. So that's in kind of normal life. I mean, normally at home. I'm not eating Thai food, I'm eating like beans on toast and, and scrambled egg and stuff. Really uninteresting meals. But on the trail, I struggle so much and I've just like got worse, I think, as the, as the time's gone on because I've eaten so many things that I think I never want to eat that again. So cliff bars, I've eaten so many of those <laughs> packets of tuna. I'm just like, I can't even look at a tin of tuna ever again. And I still like, when I came back from the first trail, 
I couldn't look at tuna and gradually I reintroduced it into my life. But now I'm like, no, I just can't. I can't even bear it. Um, so I do survive. This, is, this isn't an exaggeration. I do survive on crisps or chips, as they call them in America, and chocolate bars. I've literally not a lot else I eat, towards, especially towards the end of the trail. And <laughs> by the end of the trail, I was eating um, those awful, did you ever eat Slim Jims? Slim Jim. Oh, they're they're like a pepperoni. Oh but no, I could yeah. never. I could never. Oh no, I can't even face pepperoni. Oh no. No, I mean I don't really like them either. But I was desperate, so I <laughs> ate them. And I was eating like one of these with a crisp, like at the same time to kind of you know take the edge off. And um, I was like, this is healthy. It's just meat and potatoes. <laughs> so I was, I was on a meat and potato diet basically. Um, but yeah, trail trail food is hard. It's hard, and I find. I'd always advise all these people who kind of package up all their boxes beforehand and get all their trail meals organized. It's like, don't do that because you, your tastes will change and you will get sick of everything you're eating. So, um, yeah, it's really hard. And all those kind of uh, just add water freeze dried meals that I mean, they're all right, but they're expensive. So you can't really survive on those for all the time. Um, and I also went stoveless for half of the trail, basically. So I shipped my stove ahead because it was just too hot to want to eat anything hot. So, yeah, I would eat, I would pack out some hummus. I'd pack out like those little packets of guacamole, which lasted a few days. Um, and yeah, just, just crap, basically sugary rubbish is what I survived on, which is, you know, coming home and having lost loads of weight and then you're still craving all this sugary crap. It's not good. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. What time do you wake up in the morning? Uh, generally, now or on the trail? Uh, now. Like, are you a morning person or are you like a late riser or are you like a 5 a.m., 6 a.m. person? I would love to be an early riser. I'm just, as hard as I try, I'm just not. I think between 7 and 8, my body naturally wakes up. Um, I've tried to set an alarm to get up earlier. I think, oh, I'll go to the gym before work. And I open my eyes and I shut them again straight away. I think, no, this is too early. Um, I would love to be a morning person. But unfortunately, I tend to, when I'm, at, when I'm working at home, so I'm doing some freelance graphic work and obviously doing all the work for my Ocean Rose by getting like, all the website done and all the uh, sponsor packs done, all this, I work much better at night. It's just the way I've always been. So I tend to find myself staying up late and I'm by one o'clock in the morning I'm just like oh my god I need to go to bed which isn't conducive to being an early riser so I think I'm just gonna have to accept the fact that I work better at night I'm just gonna not have to get up early in the morning go for it any tattoos no I'm way too scaredy cat to get a tattoo um not because I'm scared of the pain just because I am generally faddy with my food and with most things in life. So I will get bored of things really easily. And I think if I got a tattoo, I would get bored of it really easily. And my dad would disown me. So there are two reasons why I'm not getting a tattoo. But I don't I don't have any problem with them on other people. I just know that I would be like, oh, I wish I didn't have this on my body after like a year or so. What do you do to relax? um yeah interesting question actually because at the moment I've been I've been finding it really hard to relax and I've been getting quite a lot of anxiety but just before like I'm not an anxious person generally but just before I go to sleep I'm lying down and all of a sudden it'll kick in and I'll be like oh why am I like why am I feeling so anxious just before I want to go to sleep um and it's really hard in today's day and age where you're constantly being stimulated by something. So like your phone is just, there's always something there for you to look at, always something there for you to do. There's, you can watch TV and be on your phone. So if you're not being, having that simulation, it's really hard. And what I found really working for me at the moment is swimming because you have no other option. You're in the water. You can't be, you know, you can't have a TV on. You can't have music on. You can't listen to anything. You're just under the water and everything is super peaceful. And I concentrate on counting my, my lengths. So my mind is occupied with that. And I, it's a real chance to just switch off, relax in the pool for an hour you know, that's all you're thinking about. So swimming has been really good recently for me. Yeah, love it. Two more questions. Uh, what's your best bit of kit? 
Oh, investment of kit. Um, I've got so much kit I really like, but there are a few, there are a couple of things that have been on every adventure with me and they've survived really well. One of them is my Z-Pack sleeping bag. It's still going really strong. Um, it's been washed a few times, maybe twice. Um, and it's still, you know, I, there's no reason for me to replace it at all. And my Neoair Thermarest, the same thing. It's been with me on every trip. It's been slept on so many times and it's still going really strong. I really recommend that. Although uh, Thermarest have brought out this new Uber light now, which I'm like, well, I don't need one, but I really want one. <laughs> so it's hard because when your kit's not worn out, you don't really need a new one, but something new and shiny comes along. You're like, oh, because I'm a bit of a magpie for kit as well. I like to collect it. Um so yeah and especially like working in an outdoor shop for a couple of days a week you see all this new stuff and you're like well I don't need that but but I really want it um so yeah my my trusty bits of kit have to be my my mat and my bag they they're still going strong final question what mantra or quote do you do you live by do you have one um I don't think I have a quote that I really live by. Um, I there are lots of quotes that I think are good and they kind of are motivational and things like that. But I would I wrote this I wrote this piece that was like ten bits of advice I would give to my like ten year old self or whatever however old I, I chose. And um, the first one was don't fear failure. And I have to revisit that pretty much every day. I have to remind myself because I'm really scared of failure. It, it affects me. It's probably affected me my whole life. I hated failing anything at school. I hated getting anything wrong. And I still, I think failure sometimes holds me back a little bit from trying stuff. And it shouldn't. And I know, and that's the advice I would give to anyone else. It's like, don't be scared of failing. It's fine. You know, it doesn't matter if you get something wrong. You can just do it again. Or it doesn't matter if you don't achieve this. You can get another, have another go. But again, in the back of my mind, there's a little voice being like, you don't want to fail at anything. You know, yeah, you're going to, oh, don't be a failure. Um, so I do have to remind myself um, a lot of, you know, failure makes us stronger, basically. So, yeah, maybe that is it. Failure does make us stronger. But it, but it's definitely something I have to keep revisiting to to make sure it's hammered into my my mind. Love that. Very, very powerful. And um, Alex, how can people follow along with your you, with your future challenges and keep up to date with you? I know you ha- you know you do have a blog and there's obviously a website for the Fear Ocean Road. You just want to share your links or the best place for people to find you? Yeah, so um I have a personal blog which is masonalexandra.com and um, you can follow along with that. I'm actually going out to hike the John Muir Trail as a mini adventure in uh, September. So I'll be blogging about that. And you can follow on on Instagram and all that kind of usual stuff, Mason Alexandra again. Um, and all stuff to do with the row can be found. Web address is monkeyfistadventures.com. And the other handles are um, at underscore monkey fist for most of the channels. And if you search monkey fist adventures, you'll find it on Facebook and all stuff like that. Um, so that's where we'll be updating everything about the row. Um, our rowing challenge is called Brainwaves, uh, the name of our team. Um, hopefully, if you like, think about that a bit, it'll become clear. So, you know, we're looking at neurological disorders and we're on the ocean so you know um we put it to a public vote luckily they didn't give us something like boat to boat face they gave us brainwaves so uh, that's good but yeah so monkey fist adventures for the ocean and mason alexandra for my personal stuff fantastic and i'll make sure i put all of the links in the show notes which will be available at toughgirlchallenges.com alex thank you so much for coming on the tough girl podcast to share more about your adventures and your journeys and i'm so excited about following along with with your john muir trail and also your big ocean row in 2020 that's going to be incredible um, and i just want to wish you all the best um yeah super excited for you oh thanks sarah thanks for having me
Hey Tribe, how are you doing? I hope you're all well. So I just want to give you a quick update on what's been happening because there has been a lot going on over the past couple of weeks. So if you've been following along on my Instagram stories at Tough Girl Challenges, that's where you can sort of get the more up-to-date live version of what's been going on. But I have been at a four-week intensive uh, personal training course. So I'm now a qualified personal trainer, yay me, which is super exciting. So I mean, that worked out really, really well because, you know, obviously fitness and exercise is a real passion of mine and I do want to be able to help more women with their adventures and challenges and to be able to provide really practical advice for them, especially if they're, you know, going after an adventure challenge and stepping outside their comfort zone. So I am a qualified personal trainer now, which is awesome. I'm going to start to build up a business around that to basically fund my passion, the Tough Girl podcast. The second um, thing that I've been up to is I've been down to London. So I've been working at Royal Ascot. I sell silk top hats. It's very random, but I do have lots of very random jobs that I do to try and earn extra income and extra money. Um, But as you may know, as I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, the reason I'm able to produce these extra episodes like Tough Girl Extra and go back to speak to previous guests is because of the support of patrons. So individual men and women all around the world who are supporting the work that I do and really believe in the mission about increasing the amount of female role models out there. So there's currently 220 individuals, which is absolutely incredible. And I'd love to reach 250. If you could sign up, if you've been listening for a while, if you've been listening for, you know, six months, a year, or you've binge listened to hundreds of episodes, then please do think about paying it forward. Even if it's just a one-off donation of $20, you can do that via PayPal. All the links are on the website, toughgirlchallenges.com, or even just sign up at $2 a month or $5 a month. It really does make a massive difference. Think of it as like a subscription to your favorite magazine. Or think of it as taking me out for a coffee once a month, even though I don't drink coffee. But do you know what I mean? Take, think of it out as taking me out for a little drink once a month because that would make such a massive difference. You know, five dollars a month with lots of people giving at that level would just be a real game changer for me and and um, and help me to grow and develop uh, the Tough Girl podcast. But I've got some really really exciting things coming up or happening in August, which I just very quickly want to share with you. So the Tough Girl podcast was launched on the fourth of August. 2015. So we're coming up to the fourth year birthday and I want to do loads of stuff to help celebrate this and make it a bit of an occasion. So just a couple of things I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be releasing four episodes on the 4th of August with special guests, which will be super epic. I'm also going to be speaking to members of the Tough Girl Tribe and these are going to be coming out as Tough Girl Extra episodes. So we're going to have the normal episodes. So normal episodes come out um, every Tuesday, the Tough Girl podcast, Tuesday, 7 a.m. UK time. So they will be coming out as normal throughout August. And then on the 4th of August, We'll have four special episodes dropping. And then every Thursday throughout August as well, we'll be catching up with members of the Tough Girl Tribe who are going to be sharing their individual stories of how the Tough Girl podcast has helped to change their life. So I'm super excited about bringing you all of these special episodes. It's obviously going to be a huge amount of work, but I'm so excited and I'm so pumped to speak to all of these incredible women. Just want to do um, a couple of shout outs as well. Massive thank you for Jennifer for signing up as a patron, Gillian Lund, um, Kate Gardner. Massive thank you to Barefoot Hiker Adventures, who's increase their pledge from two dollars to ten dollars really do appreciate that thank you so much and claire Killigon, thank you so much for um for signing up as a patron so we've had five new patrons in june which is incredible it really does make a massive difference to me which i probably say all the time so thank you so much from the bottom of my heart if you want to support the podcast then please do go check out patreon p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash tough girl podcast if you also if you're new to the podcast this is the first time you're listening thank you so much for giving up your time i really do appreciate it we've got a massive back catalogue of over 200 um 200 plus stories of women doing adventure and challenges all around the world all different ages all different shapes and sizes um a whole variety of different challenges i am really really working hard on my diversity and also the different types of challenge that that women are doing so when you only do like 52 episodes a year it is difficult but if you've got any names and suggestions of women that you'd like me to interview please do send me an email please do let me know i'm very approachable um you can access me on a whole variety of different platforms i am on you know twitter instagram facebook um etc and i do have there's a main on my website you can send me a direct message through there as well i if i don't respond straight away it's not that i haven't received it. it's not that i don't care it's just I, I do get quite a lot of messages and i will always come back to you it may just take me a while and if you still haven't heard back from me please do chase me especially on instagram because with how instagram messages work is when i get sent messages and then i read them if i don't necessarily reply straight away and then more messages just come it just gets sent further and further down the down the the list of messages that I get coming in and then I I can't basically find the message again where I need to reply I know that sounds weird but if you understand Instagram you'll understand what I'm saying so I know I'm trying to find out a better figure out a better system of how of how to work that but 
if you have messaged me on Instagram, for example, and, and I haven't come back to you and you think, you, you know, you should be getting a reply, can you please just chase me up? I honestly won't be offended at all. It will be a really nice reminder for me and think, oh my goodness, how have I forgotten to reply to you? So I do massively apologize. Anyway, I hope you are really well, wherever you are in the world, whatever you are doing. I hope you're getting after your goals. I hope you've got a plan. I hope you know what it is that you want to achieve. I hope you're starting with the end goal in mind. And I hope you are forgetting about any naysayers and any people who say you can't do anything because you can believe in yourself I believe in you you are fantastic you are amazing go and have an awesome day and I'll be back with you next Tuesday for another awesome episode of the tough girl podcast all right take care lots of love and I'll speak to you soon bye